Well, good morning, everyone. It is two minutes after 945, so as I promised, here I am again. Hopefully, you all enjoyed a delicious breakfast. Could we give a big round of applause for... Thank you, to, thank you to all those who did work setting up, who made casseroles, who hand ground coffee today when they found that the coffee came as beans, not ground. We put the, they pulled out, the Wilsons pulled out all the stops for us today, fresh ground premium. So it was a lovely breakfast and we thank everyone for all the work you did there today. Um, We've got a wonderful service today to celebrate our risen Lord. Um, you can see uh, everybody should have bulletins in the middle of the table that will show you the order we're going to go through. Um, we've got songs. We've got uh, our, our uh, personal uh, congregational harpist here again today, which I'm very excited about. Yeah. And then uh, we will be taking communion. Uh, so you'll see there are some cups in the middle of the table. If you need a gluten-free option, there are some sitting out on the table uh, on the entryway there, which Phil Grimley, thank you, Vanna, is, uh, is modeling for us. Thank you for not wearing the dress, Phil. <laughs> uh, and uh, yeah, so without further ado, let me give uh, thanks to open our, our service, and we'll get to it. Lord, once again, you are great, and we thank you um, for all that you have done for us, for your salvation, um, for your love for us, for your power in creation, your power over death, um, your power in changing our hearts. We thank you for the Spirit and how he shapes us and works us. Lord, we pray today that you would be honored with our praise. Um, we pray that we would come to know you more. We pray that you would give us um, a deeper sense of the blessings we have in you, of the hope of eternal life, um, the hope for being a little more um, like your son day by day. Um, and we pray that uh, our worship today would be honoring to you, would draw us closer together as a fellowship of believers. Um, and we pray um, that we would carry the light uh, that we have out of this building, too, because of the, the gift that you have given us. And it's the name of your risen Son, we pray. Amen. As we gather together this morning, I think of three R's. Remember, reflect, and rejoice. And as I have been remembering and reflecting I think back four years ago, 2020, where were we? Locked up in our homes. 2021, we met here for the first time for a service. We didn't eat. But that was a magnificent time for me and Linnea on the piano, I know, because you were out there singing, rejoicing with full hearts. We were together again. And I trust that this morning as we sing, as we lift our praise, as we rejoice, we can have that same excitement, that same rejoicing. Let's open with thine is the glory, risen conquering sun.
As we prepare to take the bread, let's sing, Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe, verses one and two. It's only appropriate that on the day that we celebrate the resurrection of Jesus, that we join together in communion. So uh, let's join together and pray this morning for communion. Father God, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord, for being the great creator of the universe who had a plan from the very beginning, Lord. Thank you for that plan that sacrificed Jesus for us, that we might spend eternity with you. Lord, Thank you for the bread that represents the flesh of Christ, who was broken, beaten, and crushed for our sin. Lord, thank you for covering our iniquities in such a marvelous plan. Thank you for the bread that represents us. May we rem remember it, not just today, but every day. In your name we pray. Amen. So at Stratford, Stratford Park, uh, we have a policy of an open communion. So uh, as we partake, after I read the uh, scripture, uh, everybody is welcome uh, as they uh, have uh, asked Christ into their heart and asked him as, his, as their Lord and Savior. Let's read 1 Corinthians eleven twenty three 23 through 24. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it, and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. The bread is found in the top of the cups here.
morning. As we prepare to take from the cup, I'm going to read from 1 Corinthians chapter 11, starting in verse 25. So in the same way, he took the cup also after supper, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you, pro- you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray for the cup. Dear Jesus, um, you are the holy lamb of God. You are the only perfect and willing sacrifice um, able to carry the weight of the sin of the world. Lord, we have each gone our own way and we are in need of your, your grace and your mercy and your forgiveness. Lord, as we come before your table and we prepare to take from the cup, which represents your blood, we remember your great sacrifice on the cross and the blood that was shed for the atonement of our sin. We love you, Lord. It's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. So I'd like for our next... uh, segment. I'm not sure the right word there. I'd like to introduce you to Kizens Nicholas. I probably said that wrong, Kizens. I'm sorry. Um, He's not only new to the chapel, but he's new to the U.S. He actually moved here about five weeks ago. Um, For those of you who know uh, Vera Vanderzee, who's been attending here for a while, uh, sister of Hannah Nerat, um, they initially met when she was on a missions trip to Haiti back in 2009. Six months ago, they reconnected, and she decided to sponsor him to to be here in the U.S. Um, So he arrived about five weeks ago, like I said, and he's excited to tell us his story. The most exciting thing I know about Kizens is he also plays bass. So (laughs) there's probably a lot more than that. Kizens, why don't you come tell us your story? Good morning, church. Kisins um, Nicola is my full name, and Haiti is my country, and I am 25 years old. Today I'm going to share with you about how Jesus has made a difference in my life. I thank God first, and Pastor Jeremiah and his team who chose me to testify the greatness of our God. Luke chapter 21, verse 13. This will be your opportunity to be witness. Um, First of all, I grew up in orphanage in Haiti. I grew up without love of a father. I want to share that with you. With everyone who is here who has a father and a mother, show respect and love for them. When I finished my high school in 2019, I thought that success in life was only through education. In Haiti, many parents want to see their children become lawyer, engineer, and doctor, and so on. And that's when they believe that they have a man or woman who is successful in life. I wanted to become a doctor. I registered in one of the greatest medical universities in Haiti with the support of so who lived in the United States. I started the study, but the country's, prob- the country's economic problems and political instability prevented me from completing the study. Then my sponsor decided not to support me, and because of that, I thought that If this person no longer supports me, I will no longer have the opportunity to become an important man in life. I was hopeless 
because my parents can pay my university fees. And the same year, I tried to learn management in the state university. Their courses were in the, in the afternoon, but I could not continue because of unrest and hate. I was passionate about photography and videography and music. I decided to learn more on the internet like YouTube, and I was one of the best photographers and video editors in my city. I started to make money, but because of the advanced technology of smartphones, people were not interested in hiring someone to make photos for weddings and other activities. It was becoming difficult to find a contract. Once again, my hope was over because I could not be what I hoped. One day, I thought to myself, why can't I have the possibility of achieving everything I want, like my university, my company photos and video, and so on? But I never put Jesus first in my stuff last time. Sometimes it's when things go wrong that we are forced to ask God to help us. At this moment, I thought that through knowledge, you could become great and achieve everything. But now I understand when you are a person chosen by God, it's not what you want to do or it's not in the way you want to do things, they will be done. But it, it's the way Jesus wants you to do them. And, then, and then things will be done. And I decided to take a break from life with the Bible and I decided to take control of my life. I said, do what you want to do with me, and I will follow your will. It's been over one year. I haven't, had, I haven't had much money. I lost a lot of friends. I lost value in the hires of certain people who thought that I was going to become a doctor, like photographer, videographer, and so on. But I still believed that God would raise me up. I trusted the process. And my mother told me, if you feel ready, give your life to God. Get baptized. It's time for God to raise you. So I decided to get baptized. St. Jesus began to show me that it is not school that raises people. And you can have knowledge, but without the wisdom of God, you will fail. So God has said, wisdom is better than wealth. I needed God's wisdom more than I needed the word righteous. Since that, that time, I have learned to trust his plan for me, and I believe that he will never let political, onerous, or economic problems destroy his plan for me. At that point, I, I agreed to follow and do his will. I started playing music in my church. After a period of time, the church community appointed me assistant youth president, I think what we call here youth pastor. Then I became the second music director of the church. And I came to look for a job and I became the manager of one of the biggest hotels in the city where I lived. I have a team on my church to pay monthly to the inventory and so on. And finally, the things I didn't understand about leading at the church is that God gave me a ministry where every week we give educational support where, whether it is the word of God, social life, or food, and so on. And then when I decided to give my life to God, it wakes me up and made me everything he wanted me to be. And I never thought I could come to the United States because I don't have any family here. Guess what? God gave me friends in the United States who are more than family. <laughs> I learned that his pain is always best. When it seemed like everything is in life was going wrong, God has a plan. I have found new life in Jesus, and you can have that same life too. 
if you trust in Jesus. That's my story. Thank you. It's your turn. We'll begin with a responsive reading from Matthew chapter 28, and then I'd ask you to stand and blend your voices as we sing together uh, a package of three hymns to the resurrection. He is risen, alleluia. After the Sabbath, at dawn, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene and the other Mary went to look at the tomb. There was a silent earthquake, for an angel of the Lord came down from heaven, and going into the tomb, rolled back the stone and sat on it. 
His appearance was like lightning, and his clothes were white as snow. The guards were so afraid of him that they shook and became like dead men. The angel said to the women, Do not be afraid, for I know that you are looking for Jesus, who was crucified. He is not here, he is not here. He has risen, just as he said. He is not here.
Good morning. Christ is risen. Amen. Amen. I don't know about you, but I was overcome a bit with some emotion this morning with all the beauty. How about you? The beauty of the music, the the beauty of a testimony of a life changed. How wonderful to share this together. I'm going to read from Luke chapter 24, starting with verse 13. That very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus, about seven miles from Jerusalem. And they were talking with each other about all the things that had happened. While they were talking and discussing together, Jesus himself drew near and went with them. But their eyes were kept from recognizing him, and he said to them, What is this conversation that you are holding with each other as you walk? And they stood still, looking sad. Then one of them, named Cleopas, answered him, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who does not know the things that have happened there in these days? And he said to them, What things? And they said to him, Concerning Jesus of Nazareth, a man who was a mighty in deed and word before God and all the people, and how our chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him, But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things happened. Moreover, some women of our company amazed us. They were at the tomb early in the morning, and when they did not find his body, they came back saying that they had even seen a vision of Angels who said that he was alive. Some of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women had said, but him they did not see. And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart, Slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken? Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning So they drew near to the village to which they were going. He acted as if he were going farther, but they urged him strongly, saying, Stay with us, for it is toward evening, and the day is now far spent. So he went in to stay with them. When he was at table with them, he took the bread and blessed, and broke it, and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. And they recognized him. And he vanished from their sight. They said to each other, Did not our hearts burn within us while he talked to us on the road? While he opened to us the scriptures. And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. And they found the eleven. And those who were with them gathered. Saying, the Lord is risen indeed. And has appeared to Simon. Then they told what had happened on the road. And how he was known to them. In the breaking 
of the bread. Good morning. <clears throat> he is risen. He is risen it's wonderful to celebrate our salvation. And this morning, we are going on a journey together. We're off to the tiny village of Emmaus, about seven miles east of Jerusalem. And we're going to tag along with two disciples, possibly a husband and wife, who are heading home from the Passover. It's been a week like no other, not just a high holiday, a celebration, but the excitement generated by the raising of Lazarus from the dead and then the triumphal entry of Jesus into Jerusalem. It seemed as if he was finally going to reveal himself in power. And then, just as quickly, all of those expectations were dashed, turned to ruin. Jesus was arrested in the night, falsely accused, handed over to the Romans, and then crucified. And now these two are heading home with heavy hearts. They're confused, bewildered, upset. They're trying to make sense of it all. And it's our privilege to walk that road with them this morning. The text says, that very day, two of them were going to a village named Emmaus. In context, it's the day the tomb was found empty, the day the women encountered the angels, the day that Peter and John ran to see for themselves. On that very day, there were two disciples heading home. Is it any wonder that they were talking to each other about all these things that had happened? Verse 14. Verse 15 adds an intensifier. It says that they were debating. So talking and debating, working it over. And if they were husband and wife, it's not hard to imagine the banter. They could just pour it all out. The surprise and the hurt and the confusion, mostly confusion. What had just happened? Must have been a bit like that 30-0 run that we saw yesterday. <laughs> and why had Christ been crucified? What did it mean? How did it square with his messianic claims? Had they been wrong about him? We can hear them going back and forth. Tasha and I love to go for walks. We always have. That's how our relationship blossomed on the streets of Oak Park many years ago now. We would walk and talk, and we'd bring up some topic and then go at it. We'd turn it up down and all around and come at it for, from every angle, and it might occupy uh, days of discussion. And that's what this pair were doing. They were distraught, and they were trying to make sense of what was happening. And while they were talking... Verse 16, Jesus himself drew near and went with them, but their eyes were kept from recognizing him. Jesus approaches, presumably from the rear, to them on the road, and mysteriously, his identity is hidden from them, which is the whole fun of the passage. As readers, we are let in on this delightful secret. Here they are discussing his death and the empty tomb, and he joins in the conversation, feigning ignorance. What is this conversation that you are holding? Verse 17. He wants to hear them out before he reveals himself. And so he doesn't let on that he knows anything. Made quite clear when Cleopas responds, Are you the only visitor to Jerusalem who doesn't know the things that have happened? Somehow Jesus has convinced them of his ignorance, and so now they have someone to witness to. But before they do, I want you to notice one important detail. Look at their response to his question. It's at the end of verse 17. They stood still, looking sad. 
This is a huge clue as to their demeanor and quite possibly the reason why Jesus has come to them. They've heard the resurrection reports, but they don't necessarily believe it to be true. They're curious and confused, but mostly troubled. And with one question, Jesus has sucked all the wind out of their sails. They stop dead in their tracks and with slumped shoulders and long faces. They begin to tell their story. And Cleopas starts off by registering shock. Do you not know the things that have happened? To which Jesus responds, what things? And off they go. Verses 19 through 24, they tell him the whole story. It's about Jesus of Nazareth. A man who was a prophet, mighty in deed and word before God and all the people. But the chief priests and rulers delivered him up to be condemned to death and crucified him. But we had hoped that he was the one to redeem Israel. Right there, in this one statement, you have the cause of their sorrow. His death has shattered their hopes. This is not how things were supposed to turn out. So again, what does it mean? Was he a fraud? Have they been fooled? Is there to be no redemption of Israel? This is what they're articulating. It's the death of a dream. And then, almost as an afterthought, they include the troubling events of the morning. Verse 21 second part. Yes, and besides all this, it is now the third day since these things have happened, and some women of our company have amazed us. They went to the tomb early in the morning and didn't find his body, and then some who were with us went as well, but him they did not, did not see. Given their sadness, it seems clear they're more than skeptical about all this. They've already been deeply disappointed, and should they let themselves believe again? Peter and John investigated, but there was nothing to show for it. And besides, dead men are dead. People don't come back to life. Well, maybe Lazarus. But the Lord had done that, and now he's the one that's dead and gone. And this brings us to Jesus' response in verse 25. They have said their piece, and now it's time for this stranger on the road to speak. Verse 25 And he said to them, O foolish ones, and slow of heart to believe all that the prophets have spoken. There's something endearing in this address, even if it is a gentle rebuke. Their Lord has come to them to draw them back into the scriptures. Jesus hasn't been acting alone. He has been obedient to the Father in accordance with the prophetic testimony of the Old Testament. Their problem is not having the proper framework in which to understand these things. But Jesus takes them back to the Word. Look at his question in verse 26. Was it not necessary that the Christ should suffer these things and enter into his glory? Necessary. Not because of our need, but necessary because of God's redemptive plan. Necessary because it was his purpose from the beginning of time. Necessary because it was foretold in the prophetic testimony. Verse 27. And beginning with Moses and all the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. I don't know if this is a standard lecture that Jesus had, but boy, I would love to hear it one day in glory, wouldn't you? Wouldn't it have been wonderful to be on that road listening to the Master? Jesus opened the word to them and showed them the many places that spoke of his suffering and also his coming glory starting at Moses, which refers to the Pentateuch, the first five books of the Old Testament. So he might have gone all the way back to Genesis chapter 3, where we find the curse spoken to the serpent. I will put enmity between you and the woman, and between your offspring 
and her offspring. He shall bruise your head, and you shall bruise his heel. And then there's 2 Samuel 7.14. I will discipline him with the rod of men, with the stripes of the sons of men. Psalm 22. My God, my God, why have you forgotten me? Psalm 16, verse 10. For you will not abandon my soul to Sheol, or let your Holy One see corruption. And of course, the most instructive in Isaiah 53. He was despised and rejected by men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. Surely he has borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we esteemed him stricken, smitten by God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Yet he shall see his offspring. He shall prolong his days. The will of the Lord shall prosper in his hand. Glorious text that speak of the Savior. And these two on the road basked in his teaching for perhaps hours. And then much too quickly, they came to the village and it was time to part. And Jesus, it says in verse 28, acted as if he were going farther. But they protested it was getting late. It was time to get off the road and rest. I think really they just didn't want to let him go. They were spellbound. And so he came in and some food was prepared. And when they sat down together, he took the bread and blessed it. And he broke it and gave it to them. And their eyes were opened. Can you imagine their surprise? It was Jesus, the very one all these prophecies were speaking of. He had been with them all this time. And then just as quickly he, as he had come, he was gone again, vanished. What a revelation. Now they knew that the rumors were true. They had seen the resurrected Lord with their own eyes. Jesus is alive. He is risen from the dead. And at that moment, all of the pieces started falling into place. These things, all that they had been discussing, now have a context rooted in the Word of God in the Hebrew Scriptures. The Messiah has come has died, as prophesied, but is alive again. And this brings us to their response. Jesus is gone now, and so they turn to one another with, I think, wild looks of bewilderment, wonder, and joy. And the first thing out of their mouths is not what they have just seen, it's what they have just heard. Did not our hearts burn within us when he talked to us on the road, while he opened to us the scriptures. Can you see the transformation that's taken place? Only a short time ago, they had stalled on the road, almost too depressed to move. No energy because of their great sorrow. And now they're excited, refreshed, and motivated. They've been touched not only by the reality of the resurrection, but by the testimony of God's word. They had had a session with the master himself. And I think he knew that if he had revealed himself before explaining the scriptures, they wouldn't have heard a word of it. Jesus has intentionally anchored these things, his life and death and resurrection, to the testimony of the scriptures. The timeless word of God that does not change or fade. The very word of God that we hold in our hands this morning. Why did Jesus do that? Because he knew that future generations would not have the same opportunity to see him face to face. We believe because of the testimony of others. And because of the witness of the scriptures. What was prophesied has come to pass. And we have a Savior in the risen Lord, God's anointed Messiah. Have you had this same experience? Your heart burning within you as you turn to God's word? It's not uncommon. 
It's what we should expect as believers, the Spirit of God bearing testimony to the truth of God. It's those aha moments we have when we're reading the Scriptures and they come alive to us, when spiritual realities become clear. These disciples on the road felt the power of the Word of God, and it changed them. Verse 33, And they rose that same hour and returned to Jerusalem. A few minutes ago, it was getting late. Time to get off the road. But now in the middle of the night, when it would have been hard to see and when their safety couldn't be guaranteed, they begin the seven-mile ascent back up into Jerusalem. There's no waiting until morning. They have to go now. And so off they trudge all the way back to the city to tell their story to the apostles who have all been visited by the Lord and who out the Lord has risen indeed. I think that's the first time that little exchange took place. What a wonderful moment. All of these disciples shared. The buzz in the room must have been tremendous. Happy hearts, praising God and repeating over and over, the Lord is risen indeed. Which is the truth that we celebrate this morning. And it's a truth that is very personal to each of us. Just as it was to them. It had been their great concern. They had hoped that he was going to redeem Israel. And what they had just come to learn in his death and resurrection was that he did indeed redeem Israel. Just not in the way they expected. Not the nation. He came to redeem spiritual Israel. And I can't help but think that their testimony about what Jesus had said became foundational in the formation of the gospel. We often wonder how the early disciples moved from their false perceptions about Christ to the gospel as articulated in the New Testament. Remember, just a few days before Jesus is crucified, they were arguing amongst themselves as to who would be the greatest in the kingdom of God, thinking he was about to Bring it. And now they have a whole new understanding. Part of the amazing transformation in their lives is Christ's instruction. Yes, the Spirit came and guided at Pentecost. He reminded them of what Jesus had said. And we most often think that that's referring to his teaching ministry before the cross. But this is his teaching ministry after the cross. With Jesus explaining all of the references to himself in the Old Testament. And demonstrating the true nature of redemption. Some of us have been studying in Ephesians lately. And there Paul who was taught by the apostles. And helped to formulate the gospel. Articulates what Christ's death and resurrection means to him. He says. Ephesians 1 verse 7. In him. We have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, the riches of his grace, which he lavished upon us in all wisdom and insight, making known to us the mystery of his will according to his purpose, which he set forth in Christ as a plan for the fullness of time to unite all things in him, in heaven and things on earth. And then he prays a moment later, I remember you in my prayers, that you may know what is the hope to which he has called you, what are the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints, and what is the immeasurable immeasurable greatness of his power toward us who believe, according to the working of his great might that he worked in Christ when he raised him from the dead. The power that raised Christ from the dead is available to each and every one of us today. That is our great hope. That this power which raised Christ from the dead will one day raise us to be seated with him in the heavenlies. What a glorious day that will be.
There's one more other important thing that I'd want you to notice here. At the very center of this resurrection story, we find Jesus. Or should I say that he finds us? The initiative in this text is all his, and I think that's important to realize. Jesus knew these disciples were on that road and where they were at emotionally, and he comes. He sneaks up on them, as it were, and he starts the conversation. And I believe that the disciples on the road to Emmaus are meant to be representative. We don't even know both of their names, and this is the only mention that we have in the, uh, of them in the entire Bible. And for all of these reasons, I believe it's possible for us to identify with them. These aren't heroes of the faith. They're just ordinary disciples, somewhat bewildered and flustered and on their way home. And so one of the heartwarming aspects of Luke chapter 24 is that Jesus pursues them. He knows and he cares and he meets them on their way. He journeys with them. And I want to say to you this Easter morning that Jesus wants to journey with you. He knows your name and he cares and he has taken the initiative to earn your salvation, to reach out to you. And what Jesus is looking for is followers, for those who will turn to him in humility and repentance And take up their own crosses. Those who will join him in building the kingdom. It's a high calling. And a good calling. And when you join the way. Jesus will come alongside you. Just as he did for those two. On the road to Emmaus. He may have something hard to say. From time to time. Oh foolish ones. Slow to believe. But he will always encourage you. He will point you to the scriptures. And he will reveal himself. He will make your heart burn within you. That's what Jesus will do. Rod, if you'd come and lead us in our closing hymn. He lives... He lives indeed. You ask me how I know he lives? He lives within my heart. We trust that that can be the song of your testimony. Let's sing and stand together, please.
thankful for this Easter morning when we can celebrate the resurrection. And as we think of your incredible creative power, it doesn't surprise us that Christ could be raised from the dead, but what surprises us is that you would take that resurrection power and apply it to our lives, even though that we are, even though we're sinners and in rebellion against you. We thank you for your tremendous grace, for your tremendous mercy and kindness toward us. Help us, Lord, to love you this day. We pray in Amen. Jesus' name. Amen. 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 He is risen. He is risen indeed. Thank you.